you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 6 today. Um, before we get started, we have a, today is a special day. Not only do we have the, the privilege to gather together and worship, it's also somebody's birthday. <laughs> and, and I was asked by someone who shall remain anonymous, is that right Robin? <laughs> <laughs> Whose name I will not mention, that we would uh, sing happy birthday to Carolyn. And, and I am not going to tell you how old she is. She's like 30 years young and just repeating. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Carolyn. I need somebody to kick us off here. So Angie, get us started. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to embarrassed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we have been working through, uh, for a while now, our identities, our identity in Christ. When we come to Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. Paul even goes so far to describe it as a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And there are certain qualities that should reflect in our lives as a new creation. We are reconciled to God. What does that mean? It means that we have offended God, and yet He has made a way to restore a right relationship. We are his friends. Do you ever think about that? That the Almighty God, the creator of everything that we know, wants to be your friend. That, that's something that I, I struggle to grasp. You know? That God likes to hang out with me and do the things that I like to do. We have a righteousness that is not our own. We are made holy. Now, we use a lot of christian ease words, don't we? Holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. Okay? It means that we were taken out of this group, the profane, the common, and we are moved into this group, which God calls His own. We have this beautifully illustrated in the establishment of the tabernacle and then later the temple. There were instruments that were to be used in worship that had to be made holy before they could be used. They had to be marked with blood and oil. And then they became holy and they were not for profane use. <coughs> and we have been marked with both blood and oil. Blood being the blood of Christ on the cross. The oil being the Holy Spirit that has been sent. We've been set apart. We have been taken out of not His to become His. We are children of God. <coughs> not everybody is a child of God. Only those that believe. First John, John chapter 1 says, To them that believe, He gave the right to be called the children of God. Okay? <coughs> so we have this unique identity that the world doesn't really get. They see it as abnormal because see, we're no longer a part of them. Our message is a stench to them. It stinks. But to us, it's the aroma of life. We're, we're unique. We talked about um, a couple weeks ago Actually, last week, 
We talked about, it, it's all about commitment. Because see, I, I kind of got into this before I established what all of this is based on. See, when, when I'm talking about your new identity in Christ, the understanding has to be that you're His. That you are a Christian. Okay? You, you reflect Christ in your life. If that's not the case, then this doesn't apply to you. And, and I'm going to talk to you and it's just going to be noise because you're not going to get it. Not because you're stupid, okay? But because you don't have God's Spirit bringing the words to life in you. Alright? It's not a matter of intelligence. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of times intelligence gets in our way. Because God has not asked us to figure Him out. He's asked us to trust Him. Matter of fact, what pleases God? Hebrews chapter 11. What pleases God? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Think about that for a moment. Not that anybody can, but should you live an absolutely perfect life according to the law, it would still be impossible to please God. Now, the women have been going through a study, and, and I get the privilege of sitting with Christy as she's working on her notes and, and going through, and she'll, she'll talk to me about things, and I'm kind of her sounding board. And, and one of the things that we talked about is how often God requires faith before He moves. And it's not just faith going, okay, I believe you, but faith in action. A lot of times He asks them to do the most ridiculous things. And then He moves. When he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to Yom Suf, the Sea of Reeds. Okay. Well, here we are. And we've got to get to there. So I guess we'll camp out for a little while. I mean, logically, your brain is going, uh, well, here we are with the sea in front of us. And the promised land, way over on not only the other side of the sea, but the other side of the desert. Because keep in mind, the area that they are in right now is in the heart of the Sahara. Okay? And they've got to pass through that to get to where God has promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. All right, well, I mean, you've got to imagine they're, they're celebrating, they're still excited. Slavery is ended. Not only did slavery end, but boy, did it end with a bang because those that they called master gave unto them gold and silver and precious gifts before they departed. So here they are, they're heading out and they're loaded. I mean, think about it. You're driving a beat up old VW rabbit and your boss hands you over his Mercedes just so you'll leave. How many would take the Mercedes? Uh, yeah, a lot of you are just too ashamed to put your hand up. <laughs> okay. But they're going out and they're loaded. But then something happens. Pharaoh, whose heart is hardened yet again, gathers up his army. Now this is an army of one of the greatest empires on the earth at that time. So the, the army has got to be massive. They're known for their chariots. They had, uh, you know, when we talk about Egypt in the Old Testament, it wasn't just like the country of Egypt now. You know, they, they went all the way over to Libya and all the way down, probably even into Ethiopia. Okay? They were a confederation of a large number of people. And so this army is coming after Israel. And now this great campground by the beach isn't so great. Because they're cut off. And if God were not there, what would have happened? No, they'd have never made it to the sea because they'd have never got out of slavery. But God showed up, didn't He? And not only did the children walk across, the word says they walked across on dry land. And I'm reminded of a story back in the, the Jesus movement, back in the days of hippies, when the Jesus movement, you know, love 
is everything. Peace and love. And the Jesus movement was really underway. This young man came to the Lord. And man, he's hippie. Tie-dyed shirt. Lots of hair. Probably didn't smell too good. But man, when he came to salvation, he was all in. And man, he got the word and he was hungry for the word. And he's sitting on a park bench and he's reading the word and, and this older gentleman comes and sits down beside him. And they're just enjoying the day and this young man's reading and this, this young man is like, Whoa! Wow! Wow! And the older gentleman's like, <laughs> Awful excited there, young fella. What are you excited about? So oh, I'm just reading this incredible story about God and how he took this whole nation of people and he took them out of slavery and, and then they got stuck by the sea. And, and, and he opened the sea up so they could walk across. And the older man being dignified and long in the years of Christianity, also long in the years of service, he uh, was a pastor. He, he calmed the young man down because, you know, when people come to the Lord, we need to tone them down. I mean, heaven forbid that they would go out and show their excitement in the world, right? I mean, so we've got we've to mature them quickly. And he tells this young man, well, actually, that, that's archaeology and science has proven that that's not exactly what happened. And this young man is like, really? He said, yeah, he said, really, what, what happened is they came to, it wasn't actually the Red Sea, it was, it was the, the Sea of Reeds, and, and the water was probably only about two to four inches deep. It was not very deep at all. And, and so when the people came across, it, it wasn't the, the miracle that you're thinking it. And, and this, this young man was like, wow, okay, okay, well, I don't, all right. So he sits down and he starts reading again, and he's like, Whoa! The older gentleman was like, well, 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 what's got you now? He said, well, that God that took him across that sea that was only a couple inches deep, he used that couple inches of water to wipe out the entire Egyptian army. <laughs> we need passion like that, don't we? See, God requires faith, okay? And, and faith is all about commitment. If, if faith made sense, it's not faith. Okay? Faith doesn't make sense. Because God is asking you to believe something that you can't necessarily see with your physical eyes or hear with your physical ears. You can't really touch it. It's really something that's kind of indefinable. But once you have it, you know it's real. Okay? So we talked last week about commitment. Well, this week we're going to read a passage in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I just closed my Bible. So give me a minute to get there. <clears throat> so understanding that if you are a believer, if you have come in faith to the cross, and you have given up your life, you have been crucified with Christ, you have been buried, you've been resurrected anew as a new creation. Okay? Then I, I want to read this passage because this is one of those passages that for a lot of my life I read. And it's one of those things that you read the words and you kind of understand the surface of it. But when I was doing my study, I, I kind of got this as an ancillary pas passage to something else I was going to say. And as I went back and I'm working through my notes, it kind of caught me off guard because God just kind of prompted me. You ever get God where he kind of just gives you a little poke? And you're reading through and, and all of a sudden you stop and you go, wait a minute. What did I just read? And God kind of pokes you and you go back and you read it again. And, and if you're like me, it has to happen five or six or seven times because you're slow. And God has to keep poking you until you get it. Okay. Well, I'm going to read this passage. <clears throat> um... I'm going to start chapter 6, verse 14. Okay? Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he says, 
Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> now last week, I spent some time talking about um, reiterations. Do you believe this is the Word of God? Do you believe that it is inspired of God, that God intended that this word should be delivered to us? Yes. Okay, God spoke it into me. Okay. Now, he used a wide variety of people to write it. I mean, he used everything from scholars to shepherds to fishermen to farmers to politicians. Okay. He used a, a wide, varying degree of people, different education levels, different stations in life, different life experiences to write this. He allowed them to use their idioms, but he carefully orchestrated it. When he did. So when God speaks something in this word, it makes sense we pay attention, right? Okay? From in the beginning to even so Lord come. All of that is his. So when he says something, we pay attention. But what happens when he repeats something? We better open our ears, huh? Okay. What happens if he repeats it more than once? Because, <clears throat> see, I saw something in here that I, I've read this passage numerous times. I've preached on this passage before. But I saw something that with a different twist of life. Okay. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, if you look on your bulletin, you'll see what unequally yoked looks like. Okay? Now, you get to determine which of those you are. Okay? But, you know, it probably would have been more appropriate in this season and this climate to have a donkey and an elephant, wouldn't it? That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about. Okay? I want you to pay attention to how often Paul reiterates the point that God is trying to make. So Paul being led of the Spirit, he's going to repeat himself. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness. What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? <coughs> Five times in this one thought, Paul repeats himself. Now it's interesting is that in each of these cases, when he's talking about fellowship, accord, partnership, Paul uses a different word each time. I, I, I'm, I'm not by any means a Greek scholar. I know enough to get myself in trouble. Okay? But I was not aware that there were that many words in the Greek to point to the same thing. He uses five different words to discuss the relationship between a believer and an unbeliever. Okay? Now, being led by God's Spirit, this should be a huge point. 
Shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? Yes. Okay. Is this important? Yes. Okay. So, like, you, you know, there's there's certain procedures and there's certain etiquette in texting. Okay. Evidently, to be a good texter, you drop all punctuation. <laughs> you you have certain things that you do and you don't do, and heaven forbid if you type all caps. Evidently, that means you're yelling. Okay? And if you get one in all caps from me, it's not that I'm yelling. It's that the caps lock was on and I'm typing. Okay? So don't, don't panic. Pastor's not yelling at you. Pastor is just not all that adept with texting. Alright? But if we were to apply that logic here, this whole passage would be in all caps. So now I'm going to reread this text style. <laughs> <laughs> For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, what accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Got your attention, doesn't it? Yes. Didn't it? Yeah. I don't read loud. I don't actually, usually I'm not loud. I can get loud. Okay. Oh, oh, Asked by children, I can get much louder. Okay? But one of the drawbacks to written language is we lose the emphasis. Do you know how many conversations I've had via email or, or uh, chat or something where the context of what's being said is lost because a person couldn't hear how I was saying what I was saying? They heard it in their mind in a radically different way than I was saying it in my fingers. Okay? The, the heart intent... I mean, we have problems enough talking face-to-face -face with miscommunication. You know, Christy and I being such, such great marriage partners, we made an agreement a long time ago because we were, our miscommunication was, was oral. And we agreed that when we came to a, 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 an area of conflict, that we would talk it out. And, and we would come to an agreement. And, and we were so stoked, you know, being college graduates and, and, you know, Christians and in the ministry and our lives planned out ahead of us. And, and so we're like, okay, yes, we've got this marriage thing. And, and we're going to discuss and we're going to talk. And, and so the first issue comes up. I, I can't tell you what the issue was. I don't know. But we talked about it. And we were logical and we were cool and, and tempers didn't flare. And, and we came to an agreement. And she got up and did exactly the opposite thing of what we talked about. <laughs> I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought we agreed to do this. No, that's not what we agreed to. <laughs> what in the world is the value of words if what I say is not what she hears and what I mean is not what she understands? Okay? But then you get it in the written language and you don't even have body language and tonality to help you interpret Okay, so we have a, a written thing here that a lot of times I wish we could hear it as the author intended. And, and I mean the author being God, not necessarily Paul. Although I, I think it would have been helpful to hear what Paul was thinking, how he would have uh, enunciated this. But here we go. He, he, is, uh, he has reiterated himself five times. This is a critical issue. Okay, now I'm going to jump back. We're going way back into Exodus. Don't, don't turn your Bibles there. I'm just going to kind of share with you a little bit. We've cut, they've come out of the, the um, Red Sea. They, they go up to Canaan. They send the 12 spies in. They come back. Two of them give a good report. Ten say, yeah, they're right, but... And this, this was a, 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 a critical issue of faith, wasn't it? Because God had promised them that he would go before them and that he would drive their enemies out. And yet, they come back and the report is, I mean, they, they brought a cluster of grapes that it required two of them to carry. I've never seen a cluster of grapes that big. 
And yet, they say there's giants in the land. Okay? And and the, the children of Israel are like, whoa, you know, we're like grasshoppers in their sight? Dude. Uh, I don't want to go in and face that. They'll squash us. They've got cities with high walls. What, what chance have we against them? None. That's the point. God chose Israel not because they were a mighty nation, but that through them He might demonstrate how mighty He is. So, we're not going to go. All right. Because you've chosen this, not one from this generation will live to see the promised land. Into the desert for 40 years you go. Now, now then, they try to correct their course. Whoa, 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 whoa. We'll go, we'll go, we'll go. And they take off, and God says, don't go. We're going to go. You said we should go. We're going to go. Too late. That ship has sailed. You're running to the end of the dock, and there's nothing there waiting for you but open water with sharks. We're going, we're going, we're going. And they go, and what happens? They get their little hineys kicked. Okay? And so, into the desert they go. Now, when God spoke to them, and He talked to them about coming into the promised land, He said something interesting to them. He told them that they were to make neither a covenant with the people in the land, nor their gods. Okay? He said, you are to be my people. You are to separate yourselves from them and be holy unto me. Don't go in and make any agreement with these people. Now, a lot of people, I've heard so many people say, oh, what a horrible God you serve, that he required the extermination of that entire land, you know, the seven peoples. First, you need to understand, all the people in that land had already forsaken God. Okay? We know the people that were there had experienced an encounter with God before because we understand that Abraham was there and Isaac and Jacob and we understand the descendants of those families that lived there. We understand that Melchizedek was a high priest unto God. Okay? We understand that Jethro was a high priest unto God. So, so we know that they had some kind of encounter with God at some point in their history. And yet God, when He speaks to Israel, He says... I am bringing you in and I am driving them out because they have forsaken me. Okay? So it's not like God just said, oh, here's some little people. I'm just going to squish them. I'm having a bad day today. Okay? We attribute such petty thoughts to God when really they're just petty because of us. God is so far beyond us. He doesn't do things without purpose or without reason. But He tells the people of Israel, He says, when you go in there, do not make covenant with them. Don't make covenant with their gods because you will be lured away into sin. Okay? And I think that's the critical issue that's being dealt with right here. Now, this, this passage that goes on down here, they're actually quoting out of the Old Testament. I'm going to read it again. Uh, halfway through verse 16. Uh, For God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Okay? So, he's quoting out of Leviticus, and he's talking about the conditions for them to inherit the land. All right? Now, it's interesting because Paul is using this example of Israel going into Canaan, and yet he's applying it to us. Now, uh, I'm not planning on moving into Canaan. Not, well, I mean, if God takes me there, great, but I don't have any plans to do so. I don't know of any of you that are planning on moving to Canaan, save one. I know one person that's going to be moving to Canaan at some point in our life. Okay? But he's talking to us, and he's taking this, this very narrowly defined parameter, and he's expanding it to include something much bigger than what's here. Okay? Because he's including the, the world. Because, see, there's, there's two parties. There are those that are of God, and there are those that are not. And so, when, when we go into the world, you know, Paul makes it clear, he's not talking about being isolated from the world. We can't be isolated from the world for a couple of reasons. The first one is primarily because we're called to go out into the world to minister to them that we might save some from them. Okay? 
what he's saying is you can't go into the world in such a way that you become like them. He's setting up a, a very blunt reminder of the dangers inherent with fellowshipping with those that don't believe in God. The danger is that you will slide into their patterns and how easy this is. I grew up as, as a son of a sailor. Okay? My father had a colorful language and he knew words that I still don't understand the meaning of. And he could use them with profound sharpness. I have three brothers that were sailors. And if anything, they just added to the large dictionary of four-letter words that I still don't get a lot of. Okay? I have one brother in particular that is a poet in foul language. And boy, if he gets going, it's like somebody speaking in tongues. You know, I'm, I'm not sure whether to pray for an interpretation or to cast out a demon. <laughs> but one thing I've noticed is that if I'm not careful, when I spend too much time among people that that kind of language is common, where these words just slip out, a GD here, an FU there, a, a poopy somewhere else, all of a sudden I find that my language starts to slip. Okay? Now... Scripture tells us that we're not to allow any coarse talking to come out of our mouth. Okay? I think that covers two different areas. I don't think it's speaking just about bad words. I think it's talking about the types of words we use, uh, telling off-color jokes. Okay? You know, th those jokes that are just kind of right there on the cusp, or maybe even beyond the cusp. I, I think we're supposed to be better than that. Okay? But I've noticed in me, because I grew up with that kind of language, that's, that's an area of weakness that I have when I get around that. And, and you know the, the number one place that I see that kind of language at? Sporting events. Wow! Sporting events. And, and it's not even necessarily the players. A lot of times it's the people sitting in the stands. And it's an amazing thing. Uh, when we moved to Texas, one of our sons wanted to play baseball. Now, Baseball in Texas is huge. I mean, they have a fall league to see who's good enough to play, play in the spring league. So we enrolled him in the fall league, and, and we went, I mean, they have like eight baseball fields at this small field. And they had to have police walk around to keep the spectators, the parents, in line. And we were at one game, and uh, the coach from the other team was screaming and hollering, and one of the parents started yelling, and they were the poor umpire. You couldn't pay me enough. And they're, they're just going off on this umpire, and it got bad, and, and the, the police had to come in, and they had to escort the dad out. And, and sitting behind us and to my left were two women that were, wow, can you believe that guy? What a horrible example he is to the kids. Next week, the call went against our team. And those two women, <laughs> had to be escorted out because they oh, that's my child now. You can't do that to my child. And the, the language, ooh, wow. Now, I, I can't define to you a specific set of parameters as to how much is too much. But I will tell you this. If in any way your fellowship with unbelievers, because we have to be around them, don't we? I mean, they're going to be in our workplace. They're going to be where we go shopping. They're going to be people that we have to interact with on a regular basis. But there's a difference between being around them and fellowshipping with them, partnering with them. But I will, I will set you an earmark to watch for. If they are not encouraging your growth, if they are not spurring you on, if the best that they can do is just remain neutral so you stay where you are, you're in a bad spot. Okay? You're in a bad spot. Unfortunately, <coughs> oftentimes we don't even stay neutral. We don't stay neutral, do we? We're either growing yeah. or we're falling. We're either progressing or we're regressing. We don't really stay idle very much. <laughs> but if they're not encouraging your growth, if they're hindering your growth in any way, if you find yourself sliding, okay, 
you find yourself, you find it easier to do those things that you know to be wrong. And you find it easier to ignore that voice that's telling you don't do that. Okay? You're in trouble. This is the fellowship that, that, that Paul is warning you about, that God is speaking to you. Do not have fellowship. Do not have partnership. Do not have accord. Do not have an agreement with. Okay? Where are you spending your time? Okay? Well, I, to be honest with you, when I was growing up, I didn't really want to spend a lot of time around Christians. Unless we were playing football. Because Christians were boring. Man, all they ever want to do is sing hymns. They only know how to speak in King James. And all they can do is tell you what not to do. And they all look at you like this. <laughs> you know? If that's how you are as a Christian, please change your name to something else because you're not representing Christ. Okay? You're representing your idea of Christ. You look at the ministry of Christ, he fellowshiped. Look how many times he went into people's house to build them up. Matthew. Here's a, here's a sinner of sinners. I mean, this is a guy that knows better. He's taking advantage of his people, and yet Jesus comes to him and says, follow me. And Matthew gets up and follows him. So then what, what does Jesus do? He goes to Matthew's house, where Matthew invites all of his friends to come in, and, and the disciples and the Pharisees are standing at the door. They're looking in going, what's he doing in there? Doesn't he know this is a house of sinners? Well, yeah, it's a house of sinners, but how is he going to minister to them? What does Jesus say? I didn't come to heal the, 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 the well. I came to heal the sick. See, if your interaction with sinners is based on, is predicated on the idea that you are witnessing to them, you are ministering to them, you are putting out so that they might see the life that you have, that's where you're supposed to be. But if this is some other thing, I just I like being around them more than I like being around Christians. You've got a really warped idea of what fellowship is. Five times, folks. Five times we are warned about partnering with unbelievers. Their motives are different than ours. Their base is different than ours. Their morality is different than ours. Water and oil, folks. Water and oil. They don't mix. They're not supposed to mix. God has called us to be holy, to be separate. Our job is to be a witness to them, not to blend with them. So I would just lay before you today, I'm just laying right at your feet. Ponder. Ask God. Ask God and see if there would be any way in which you have partnered with unbelievers. In which you have an accord with those who are not walking in the walk that you have. I challenge you this week. Take that to the Lord in prayer. But when He answers you here, Listen and take action. Step in faith to that which he is calling you to and take action. Amen? Amen? Father, I bless you this morning for your word. I thank you that your hand is so evident on these pages. I thank you that you are greater than these pages, that these are just an introduction to you. I thank you, Father, that your spirit illuminates your word to us. That it gives us understanding where we had none. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.